working on my directorial debut. <laughs> oh, amazing. So is this um, fiction or non-fiction? Uh, no, it's non-fiction. Tell, tell me more about that. Um, I don't know how much I can tell at this point. As much as you can. As much as I can. Yeah. It's, it's a live story. It's a very topical story it's a very it's a story that's very close to my heart and mm. at its core it's a story of a grandfather searching for his missing granddaughter mm. um only it's not just any grandfather and his granddaughter is missing in a war zone oh wow so and and when do you expect that will uh uh, what's the word release? Hit the screens. Hit the screens, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hit the screens. Uh, I'm hoping it will hit the screens uh, at the end of this year, the end of 2022, inshallah. Amazing. And who, who are you um, working with? Like what studio or network? Um, network. So from, at the moment, it's with uh, BBC. Um, and I can't talk about the others yet. Okay, that's, that's totally cool. So, um, so, Dr. Miriam Frosois, I'm very pleased to have you on. Can Thanks you please, uh, can you say a little bit uh, uh, about yourself, please, by way of introduction? I'm going to pull up uh, your website page here for, for people to see as you do that. Oh, okay. Introduce myself. I always find these ones quite difficult. Um, Only because, yeah, I feel that uh, sometimes it simplifies the process. It's fine. I do. I do the same thing sometimes for my guests. But yeah. So presenter, writer, documentary filmmaker. That's exactly. There we go. You've introduced yourself already on website. <laughs> uh, the website. Uh, my website probably needs a little bit of an update. But yeah, these are, I, I guess at the heart, I'm somebody who likes to tell stories that I think matter. I believe in storytelling as a medium to communicate important issues. I um, think that storytelling is both how we hand down important messaging, but it's also one of the key ways that we can affect social change stories are what connects you to issues and stories are what allows you to tap into them with the heart rather than just the head and the head is important um but the heart is vital and, and stories perhaps as far as we know right is, is a uniquely they're a uniquely human thing it's it's really what we love to tell stories, we make sense of the world through stories, we connect with each other through stories. And um, uh, speaking of your own story a little bit, I mean, you, you have, uh, not to dwell on personal stories so much, I mean, I, I think Foucault famously or infamously hated talking about his own biography, and, but, um, which is interesting. I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, well, all the interesting allegations, which, uh, anyway, but to what Dolan Foucault too much right now. The, the personal is political. So to that extent, it's, it is important to yeah. examine the personal. But um, I also think we live in a sort of celebrity in obsessed culture where mm. the personal becomes less of a way of understanding and contextualizing someone's thinking mm. and more as a um sometimes actually a way of avoiding accountability by you know I'm a faulted person I am not a perfect person you can look at my life and find many things to criticize um but much more interesting than criticizing my life is to probably criticize things that I'm saying that you disagree with which might lead me to different conclusions which might encourage a wider conversation which might enhance our culture our society our thinking um and so to that extent you know my personal story um you know from a from a psychological perspective certainly has an impact on where I stand today on many issues but, um, but it's also con it's also unfolding it, it can Continues to unfold, right? Yeah, and we are evolving. Uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah. the, the, the film hasn't ended yet, thankfully, right? Alhamdulillah, I mean, yes. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> we're still stood. We're still stood. We're still striving. We're still moving. And right. 
I mean, yeah. I, I find it very bizarre when people, you know, religious and otherwise, they will pass judgment on people and say, oh my God, did you hear what he did? Did you, because I've experienced this my entire life, but no exaggeration. Um, uh, and, you know, have you heard, heard what she's done? And it's like, dude, like give them a chance. Like they're, they're, they're sort of, their life is still ongoing. It's still unfolding. Um, I mean, isn't that the sort of, uh, I mean, that's what I understand the best of religion to be about. It's about giving people chances to, to giving, giving people chances, but also just allowing people to be, right? It's, uh, I think there's, there's very few people that I consider, that I admire spiritually or religiously who stand in judgment of others, actually. I think they're probably way too busy trying to keep themselves in check than expending that energy on speculative assessments of other people's lives and they always are speculative you know I know mm. however well I think I know someone I don't know everything about their life and there are choices that they're making that might seem mm. completely out there to me but actually if you have God's wisdom of seeing everything from the 360 there will be reasons why those things are happening you know um, mm. and so it seems to me almost like a form of arrogance to stand in judgment of others when we don't really fully understand them and you know I, I say that even theologically I think it's grounded in our faith perspective the idea of making 70 excuses for somebody before you pass judgment well good luck I mean think about that just actually as a practice like imagine mm. if every time you jump to a conclusion you held yourself back and you actually mentally went through the 70 checklist and I can as someone who's tried it not I'm not swearing down that I do it every time but I do try and do it and when I have tried to do it I don't get past four and the reason I don't get past four is that by the mm. time I've made four excuses or that I found four excuses I'm mm. like oh my god there's like a whole there's like a whole world of good reasons really valid reasons why this might be happening so um and just more generally I think it's it's so much more important um and probably important I really mean it at a, at a metaphysical level to concentrate on your own journey and your own connection with the one that's the one that matters not how other people think of you not what you think of them not the world thinks of you just genuinely your own journey on that path however you define it however you set it whatever parameters you interpret it to mean mm. um, that really is the only one that actually matters well, that's, that's very beautifully put. Uh, and speaking of making excuses, can we make excuses for whiteness? <laughs> <laughs> well, that you know, so for firstly, let's talk about, so obviously I have a podcast called We Need to Talk About Whiteness, which mm. um, I started back in 2019. That podcast came about because I felt that I was often at the heart of conversations where um, there were worldviews that were being expressed that were completely legitimate, that worldviews I have, you know, grown up with, studied, you know, I've lived in other parts of the world, I've lived in the non-Western world, I am fully aware that there are other ways of thinking, of being, of conceiving, there are other histories, um, and so I call whiteness what I suppose other, uh, you know, the philosopher Mina Salami would call the Euro patriarchal framework. You know, it's a it's a system of thinking that is rooted in ideas of primarily white male European supremacy, intellectual supremacy, the centrality of European history as the only history of value or meaning. Um, the idea that philosophy itself really only began with, you know, European thinkers, that there have not really been any momentous contributions to the body of work we call philosophy from non-Western thinkers. You know, there, there might be a sort of a tokenistic figure brought in here and there, but by and by, you know, philosophy is still the, the purview of sort of white old men. And... Um, and so to me, it was it was really apparent that we needed to start to challenge this framework, that whiteness needed to be outed, basically. And so 
I began the podcast with the idea of trying to elucidate whiteness for people who haven't had the luxury, the privilege of the experiences that I've had. I've, I've lived in Palestine, I've lived in Morocco, I'm a Muslim, which means that by virtue of my faith, I am constantly exposed to philosophical thinking from non-Western thinkers, like the bulk of our ideological corpus <laughs> is non-Western. And um, that's, been the most enriching part of my own philosophical journey so the idea that other people haven't been exposed to that I don't sort of look at that as you know oh my god those terrible people over there it's more like oh my god guys there's so much more and once you start to understand how limiting whiteness is it's not just limiting it's an oppressive structure it's oppressive to you but more more even more than that, it's oppressive to a whole load of other people. It's oppressive to primarily black and brown people. It's particularly oppressive to people outside the Western world, the European centric world, whose lives clearly matter less than ours, whose, uh, you know, conditions of living are, you know, of less importance to us, whose children dying is less of a tragedy than ours. Um, and obviously, I hope it's obvious that I'm being deeply sarcastic. There's no truth in any of those statements. And I actually think at its core that no one really believes those statements. Like if you said to people like, oh, you know, clearly a Bengali baby is less uh, worthy of a good life than a British baby people will be like oh my god that's a horrific concept but in reality that is exactly the system that we exist in now when I say whiteness it's less to do with you know how much melanin or lack thereof you have and more to do with as I said this system that's been constructed capitalism is at the heart of it the form of capitalism that um, dominates the world today is really at the core of it. And in many ways, racial ideologies have existed first and foremost to justify the hierarchy of human value, which is essential to the maintenance of the current form of capitalism that we exist in. And, and of course, um, you, you, you speak to the question of whiteness as being someone who's white herself. So it's a very interesting kind of, and uh, maybe that's just the human condition. I mean, I hope it is more, you know, more common than not that we're all ultimately very complex, multifaceted uh, beings or trying to be and that, that we're not come from one single position, but you're speaking to the question and, and around whiteness is, has, takes on a different coloring uh, to, as it were, um, but I speak I speak from within whiteness with the un, with the recognition, if not the understanding, because that would be maybe to speak to overstep in my own positioning. But but with the recognition that as a white European, I am at the very least an unwitting participant in a system, the fact that that, that, that is um, harmful to others in the world and particularly to people of color. And that's just the reality that today, the wealth that we experience in the West, the level of comfort, the standard of living is coming to the detriment, is coming to us to the detriment of others. It doesn't have to be that way, but it is currently that way. And so as much as I can say, oh, you know, I'm somebody who, although I'm racialized as white, you know, I, I, I understand that there's a thing called whiteness. Sure, I may, you know, intellectually have grappled as much as I can or I'm still trying to grapple with where I situate myself within this wider oppressive system. I'm calling whiteness that you're a patriarchal framework. You know, some people might just say racialized capitalism. But I still, that still doesn't mean that that recognition uh, somehow removes my participation or my existence within that system, uh, nor yours <laughs> is the truth. You know, uh, from the moment we live in a European capital, that we enjoy many of the privileges that we do as Westerners, um, 
you know, we are already within a class of our, we're already like the one percent of the world, right? Oh yeah, and then, no, I, that, that's something yeah. that's so important to point out. Uh, I think I remember hearing this first put, pointed out by Tony Robbins uh, a few years ago that you know, if you have X amount of wealth, if you're living in the West, you are the one percent. Let's not yeah. forget. And and the way I've felt it to be the case uh, for a few years now, I've sort of had occasion to put it like this that the the American dream, which is basically a Western dream now, right, which is also um, the dream of the elites in, in, in sort of the global south, uh, the, the American dream is the rest of the world's nightmare because we get to live in the comfort that we do at the expense all too often of so many other people's comforts, right? The, the technologies that we use, the, the cheap clothes that we wear, on and on and on, the cheap foods. So um, yeah, it's a deeply uh, entangled sort of problem, very knotty problem. I mean, in order to have billionaires in the world, you necessarily are having people on the other end of the spectrum who are being paid, you know, 3p an hour, you know? And so I think all that I would say is a resistance to whiteness, Re resisting whiteness to me to some extent is saying, I don't see any justification morally for Europeans and principally white Europeans to benefit from huge grotesque amounts of wealth while others continue to lose babies because of curable diseases, die in childbirth when the, you know, it's 20, fucking 22 and there are still women dying giving birth like there is nothing about that that is inevitable really nothing about that that is there's inevitable nothing about that that's inevitable and there's nothing about that that's justifiable it's either gonna, uh, and and and, and it it's, cannot be there's no way that can be justified unless you know what you're saying is true which uh, I, I tend to resonate with that that there, there's clearly um a hierarchy there's a global hierarchy put in yes. place by very, I mean, these things didn't happen overnight. Um, the, the sort of construction of race and the racialization of certain uh, ethnic groups and so on and so forth, it's happened over a certain uh, consider considerable amount of time now. The, uh, the, capital, uh, the capitalistic market structures that go to fund those and fuel that process, those processes. And I mean, exactly, there, there are no billionaires in the world, right? Uh, without uh, them benefiting from essentially Absolutely. slave labor. Yes, absolutely. Slave. And we need to be clear about that because there's a whole generation of young people, particularly young men, mm. who aspire to be billionaire boys who, you know, are looking at the Instagram lifestyle and being like, yes, my dream is to become like, you know, the, the, the American dream, basically, which essentially... Mm you've described as the, uh, you know, the, the, the American nightmare for many people, but actually I also think it's the American myth because actually mm -hmm. the American myth, as I would call it, sustains the idea that anyone who works hard can succeed. Well, that's not quite true. That actually isn't true. Like statistically where you live, the school you attended, the, what your parents did for a living, all of these things, are huge factors in your subsequent success rate, uh, down to your health, like down to your health prognosis. You know, there is one Jay-Z, there are not 50,000 Jay-Zs. And I think, who was it? I, I'm gonna quote him, but I actually don't know who it was, was, you know, better than one billionaire is like 10,000 you know, young people coming up, able to start their own businesses, able to provide for their families, able to make their communities healthier, may better able to create links between people. Like that's the dream. Like the dream is that everyone can have a sustainable life. And from a theological perspective, and this is what drives a lot of what I do, I really believe that's possible. Like I really believe that if we 
recentered as human beings and came back to like the idea that we are not on this earth to accumulate huge capital. We are on this earth to serve a higher purpose, a higher set of values. Uh, you know, I would call them godly values, but you can call them whatever you like, to be honest. Like, we're still cool. Like, we can still 100% work together on this, even if you don't share the framework through which I interpret them. But together, we actually can shift the uh, culture away from the accumulation of grotesque amounts of wealth as a sign of status and success towards, you know, a more equitable system that sustains our planet, that is respectful of the other uh, living creatures that inhabit it, that ultimately really will create happier humans on a happier planet. That is all possible, uh, but not while we continue to want to all be Elon Musk. Well, so, so you're saying you're not a fan of Elon Musk? You don't yeah. think Elon Musk is going to save us all? Uh, I'm, I'm being facetious. Yeah. I mean, look, <laughs> Elon, again, I, Elon Musk is one guy. He's part of the problem. I wouldn't say he is the problem. Yeah. Um, he is... He's you a know, product of the system and he's correct. symptomatic of the deeper problems. So, yes. Yeah. I, I, I will forever be sad that there are people whose plan B involves another planet and escape from this one rather than turning inwards and seeing what can be done to improve conditions here. Like in our faith tradition, we are told that even if we knew that the world would end tomorrow, that we should still plant a tree, like however bad the reports he's reading. And I'm guessing that if he's planning a future on a different planet, that he's reading some pretty dire freaking reports about <laughs> where we are headed. And actually you don't even have to be Elon Musk to read those. You just have to actually listen to the scientists. Um, you know, rather than seeing it like, okay, we, as in we, everyone, his we is like, you know, me and whoever else, like all five other billionaires who can afford to plan to go and live on Mars. Oh, I can't hear you. Suddenly. Sorry, I just muted myself there. I was trying to pull up the, the hadith, very beautiful hadith, of course, about uh, if, if the end of times, uh, if the... Um, at the end of times. What's the hadith remind me that uh, if, 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 yeah. if yeah, if if the world was to end tomorrow, that you should still plant a tree. I mean, I, I'm yeah. paraphrasing yeah. because obviously it's in yeah, Arabic, yeah. but uh, but but basically, yeah, that's the essence. Yeah, yeah, of the, yeah. So of and and which is a hadith, right? It's because it's. I mean, the oh, I was just going to say it's very deep on multiplicity of levels. Of course, not least that. Um, I mean, the Blessed Prophet, he talks about planting a, a sapling, right? The, the, the beauty, the, because, and that's, the, that's in the very nature of the work, right? The work that we're supposed to do as human beings, as believers and, uh, and otherwise, is we do work, whether it's planting trees or building institutions or raising children and on and on and on. I mean, some, it's endless what needs to be done. Uh, but uh, it's very often the case that we will not necessarily see the true fruits of our labors, right? So, so a real kind of um, uncoupling, like the egoics of uncoupling. What's the, what's the line from the, the Bhagavad Gita, if, if, if I'm not mistaken, that something to the effect that you know, not being uh, being disconnected. Uh, oh goodness, my brain's not working. This is what happens when you have COVID, then you try to do this. But, <laughs> but uh, being yeah. disassociated from the fruits of your labors, uh, you know, that's a very tough one. That's a very tough one. Right? Well, in, in our generation, through. it's very tough because mm -hmm. we are a generation that I think uh, there's a few things going on. I think we have a sense of very individualistic achievement which is that, you know, our successes are our successes. There is no sense that actually we are part of a like much wider chain of people who our individual work may not necessarily make headlines or win us, uh, you know, whatever award that it is that you think you deserve. Um, it may not even make Instagram, but it 
will make a difference because actually if you are really working to do good in whatever sphere that good will be part of a wider chain of events that will have a positive impact moving forward and you may never see the fruits of it but they will be there and we don't have a sense of that anymore because we all want the kudos of the individual achievement and again it's a very much part of the stage of capitalism I think that we are at that you know everything is about the self and self-aggrandizement right I mean and just very quickly um this is according to this translation you you have a right to perform your prescribed duties but you're not entitled to the fruits of your actions never consider yourself to be the cause of the results of the activities nor be attached to inaction so it's a it's a sort of interesting dynamic it's neither being yeah sort of fatalistic and saying oh woe is me or you know I, I, there's nothing I can do but doing the work yeah as 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 one best understands is necessary and and then leaving the rest to God right exactly but, um, yeah uh, speaking of theology um uh the the you've, you've spoken you've touched upon this already a little bit but the the can we think of a notion of Muslimness I mean you've spoken of a notion of whiteness and this isn't you know, necessarily your own notion per se but you're drawing on, on other philosophers in discussing questions around uh, whiteness can we speak of a notion of muslimness which let's say uh, at the very least right i mean i don't think it's only this of course right but at the very least if we take sort of the edward saidi edward saidian uh, understanding of uh, you know orientalism the other uh, that was created in in the uh, example of uh, the muslim muslim other so so is is muslimness in in a certain degree in the west and again i definitely do not want to reduce it to only that playing the role of um responding to western pressures very often uh you know, to, to my mind, for example, post 9-11, there's been a lot of um, discussion amongst Muslims in the West, not least in, in, in Britain, but also in, in the US. I lived in the US for 10 years in New York, so I know a little bit about New York at this point. But uh, Muslims really trying to kind of actively engage on a societal level where perhaps previous generations, were that wasn't necessarily their concern per se. Um, anyway, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, so I think Muslimness, if I was thinking of the word Muslimness, I'm thinking of the attributes of being a Muslim, and those can either be self-defined, so my Muslimness as I define it, but I think the way in which you're suggesting it is the Muslimness, the perception of what it means to be a Muslim that is imposed upon us, and that would be very much linked to you know, the idea of Orientalism, the idea that Edward Said, obviously, whom, to whom we are much indebted, God rest his soul, um, that, you know, the idea of the Muslim, uh, the idea of the Oriental um, is formed in the Western imagination and is in many ways completely disconnected from the reality of the Orient or the Oriental, which are actually the Orientals, um, so, so in, in brief, you know, the, the, there is a perception of Muslimness, which is created in public discourse around Islam, around Muslims, which is connected to, in many ways to the post 9-11 era where Islam is still associated in many people's minds with, uh, with violence, actually, is the truth. Um, and I, that's a very painful um acknowledgement I think for me personally I, I think for a long time I was part of the, the 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 group of people you know who were trying to fight back you know and say no you know don't think that about us it's not it's not what Islam is about and um and obviously that isn't what Islam is about but it's um you know <laughs> it's it, it was it's Toni Morrison who says that um 
uh, you know, the function of racism is distraction. They will have you, uh, you know, basically spending all this time digging up your history, measuring skulls, proving who you are. And in the meantime, you're missing out on the beauty of just living who you are. And, and so for me, that is a massive thing. That was a massive turning point for me where I was like, you know, actually it's, it's my job to live out my identity as a Muslim as best I see fit. And the most good I can do within this current conversation where it's clear that people do absorb negative messaging around my faith um, is to be a living embodiment that contradicts that perception rather than trying to change them from up here. I don't debate this stuff anymore. I don't, I'm really not interested in just arguing with someone about whether is Islam a violent religion? You know, what is the true meaning of jihad? Like, you know, whatever you want to think, whatever you want to believe, you do you. I'm going to do me as best I can. And I just think that actually, if we all just focus on being, and I'm talking about us as Muslims here, I'm just trying to be the best version of Muslim that we can be. That in itself would be tidal change. Rather than being out here trying to focus on changing other people, be like, I'm going to spend expend all of that energy and trying to be the best version of myself. And that also shifts the mentality, in my view, from one which can be quite victimizing to like, oh, my God, everyone hates us. They, you know, I experience all of this, you know, very real discrimination, which does exist and it exists in the UK, but it exists even worse in my native country of France and in other parts of Europe and, of course, America, too. But actually, it's so much more empowering to in in the face of a situation that although it must be structurally resisted day to day you can't live in that space you will just drive yourself insane um and so i just find it to be a healthier space to define muslimness for myself and to try and live up to how i envisage that and that's the best form of resistance for me to the imposition of a perception of Muslimness, which has a long history. I'm probably not going to change it overnight, but I can definitely through uh, personal relationships, which therefore speak to the heart, connect with people at a human level. And through that, and them knowing that I'm Muslim, that will, I think, have a profound impact on how they think about those things. Um, and I, I, I definitely appreciate that perspective as far as uh, the spiritual, to use that problematic term again, uh, as, far, as far as the spiritual life is concerned. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, with due respect, there's um, the, the power of the Orientalist narrative. And again, I mean, I'm really not interested in, I mean, because I did that a, a lot in the past and, you know, I'm... Uh, I'm a graduate of Columbia, post-colonial studies. It's like you know, one of the major centers of post-colonial literature. Uh, yeah, Said studied there, right? Yeah. Said taught there, he was a university professor, et cetera, et cetera. Mohammed, so, uh, Mahmoud Mamdani. Mamdani, they're, they're all there. I mean, all the big names are there. So so I I, I, I'm, I was immersed in that for some time. So I'm, I'm not, try, but I'm kind of over that, to be honest. At the same time, it we, it has to be said that the, the, the nature of the discourse, right, from a Foucauldian point of view, is, is uh, you know, Foucauldian sense is such that the Orientalist discourse is very powerful to the point where someone like Roxanne Eubin, brilliant uh, scholar of uh, Islam, she wrote, I can, what I would say is one of the best uh, in, in sort of most intelligent sort of analyses of um, um, Islamic sort of you know major Islamic political thinkers. Um, she teaches what does she teach anyway, but she she makes the point in her book Enemy in the Mirror that um, uh, the the orient orientalist tropes get created in orientalist sort of um, centers of learning right and knowledge production, and then they get exported throughout the world. And then Muslims themselves, academics, putting aside 
everyday people, academics themselves, scholars of Islam, trying to think, make sense of what is this religion that we have in relation to modernity, in relation to the West, et cetera, et cetera. They end up adopting the very tropes all too often. Uh, so so it's, it, it functions at a very, uh, at a very deep level. You know, it's, uh, I, I'm not so sure that we can, so, I mean, I, I respect and, and certainly appreciate the, the, the sort of spiritual attitude that, that, that you described, uh, you know, which is its own thing, uh, as it were. From, from a theoretical point of view, I, I'm not sure how much we can disentangle ourselves from the, 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 the wider narratives. It's very hard. I mean, I, I don't think it's impossible, but it's very hard. And, and maybe this is part and parcel of the human project and experience. We are always, like maybe life is just not meant to be super comfortable because as it turns out, you know, from evolutionary theory, from an evolutionary theoretical point of view, evolutionary sociological point of view, right? We're, we're actually hardwired to want to, not, not, we don't want suffering, but we thrive under certain pressures. Like if things are too easy, like one of the reasons why uh, this is a huge problem in the West, but not just in the West, amongst affluent, uh, affluent sort of classes throughout the world now, huge issues with uh, drug, uh, drug addiction and depression and suicide, because things are too easy. So, so may, maybe in a way it's, it's not all bad, but anyway. I don't know if I'd agree that it's because it's too easy. I think I think disconnection is a huge part of that picture. You know that um, material wealth um, doesn't guarantee what constitutes the uh, social wealth, which is the quality of your interconnectedness with other humans, primarily. But also, I would argue with nature and the natural world and actually a lot of material, materially wealthy nations, the, um, the flip side of um, urbanization, the flip side of, you know, the creation of huge sprawling megalopolis, megalopolises uh, has been uh, the complete erasure of the, I would call, the, the sort of well it's the natural world but with it the reminders that connects us to a higher to a bigger picture to to a higher to a higher power and that connection but also the connection to other people is what you know and there are studies in this that you know show that the quality of your relationships determines the level of happiness in your life I mean that's a that's a real thing um so but 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 to your question you know knowledge is never produced in a vacuum and so I think the best academics are always those who are theorizing with a real awareness of the wider uh, cultural and political environment in which they are theorizing and that they try as best they can to account for that you know but ultimately and if we're going to look specifically at the production of knowledge within institutions you know those institutions are funded and a lot of that funding is dependent on output and output is measured through the extent to which that knowledge is a value to policy. And so when you start to connect the dots, then it's clear that you will see a lot of money, for example, pumped into, you know, radicalization, anti-radicalization so that you know, we get back to the picture that Saeed described so beautifully in Orientalism, which is, you know, and I, and I love to tell this story of the, the man who goes to, uh, who comes across the lion, right? And, um, you know, he, he cr comes across the lion and his encounter with the, the, with the lion having just tread into its den um, is that the, the, the lion attacks him. And so he goes back and he writes this extended piece about the ferociousness of lions. And so the next adventurer who comes across his work is like, oh, my God, ferocious lions. Let me go and study the ferociousness of lions. And before we know it, we have an entire corpus around the ferociousness of lions and how, you know, their teeth are jagged and, you know, their claws and how dangerous they are. And, 
And actually, a lot of the time, lions are quite indolent, they're quite passive, they're really nurturing to their young, they're very affectionate, like there's a whole facet of what it means to be a lion that goes completely ignored, because the one interaction that created the premise of the corpus of knowledge that was subsequently created was a conflictual one. Um, that is the story of the West's engagement with the Orient. And as Muslims, we are, you know, as Muslims in the West, we are just in many ways like the byproducts of that initial engagement, which has just been built upon and continues to be built upon. But we're also, the, you know, living with the reality of very decontextualized understandings of geopolitics. You know, the idea that ISIS, for example, are this, you know, complete sort of uh, I almost want to say like nihilistically violent group that emerged, you know, kind of almost out of nowhere. They're just like super violent Muslims that came out of like the Middle East. Yeah. Okay. I mean, where do we start? There's obviously, you know, the Iraq war, you know, millions of people die and millions of people are maimed and a country that was once, you know, one of the most highly educated, you know, a very well, broad middle class, you know, uh, people would go and, and, and study in Iraq. I mean, Iraq was this huge center of learning for us as Muslims historically and uh, until, you know, very recently, albeit that it continued in the post-colonial era to be ruled by a uh, highly repressive uh, leaders who were by and large um, more responsive to external um, acquiescence than to that of their people. Um, <laughs> somewhere where uh, there was a, a level uh, of uh, material uh, comfort for a lot of people. I mean, you cannot compare Iraq today Syria today. I mean, for anyone who actually traveled to Syria prior to, you know, the so-called civil war, um, it's, there will be a whole generation of people who will only know Iraq, who will only know Syria as like these bombed desert lands. And, you know, that is a very skewed picture of the region. Um, and it's a very skewed picture of history. And if that's all you know, then your assumption is that the people that come out of that are just these sort of barbaric people who've come from violence. And there's no conversation around, you know, I mean, so I'm a huge fan of Fanon, France Fanon, uh, the Martinican psychiatrist and his his ideas around violence and I think that there is you know as, as a Muslim I think that everything in our faith says violence is absolutely a last resort like every enjoyment that we have basically seeks mediation and ways to avoid ever confronting ever arriving at violence as a solution but that's the faith. People are not walking embodiments of Islamic theology. People are products of having their homes bombed, of having been tortured, of losing their families, of having seen people maimed and die. People are the product of the trauma in which they have grown up. And if you want to talk about trauma, you want to go talk about the generation of people who have grown up in the region, in the post-Iraq war shadow, <laughs> because there is a lot of ongoing trauma. And so, you know, hurt people, hurt people. Okay, it sounds like a really obvious cliche, but actually it's literally what happens. If you hurt people on a massive scale and you give them very little sense of, rehabilitation of accountability of those who have caused that harm um, and if that harm appears to have no uh, ending in sight then you will create um, you will create a, pe a people who believe that violence is the only response to that and that has very little to do with their faith actually I understand that people have tried to impose a sort of 
theological justification on, you know, the extreme acts of violence that people like ISIS have enacted. But I see very little that I can understand within that outside of it being a product of the trauma of the region. If you're not, if you haven't lived through that trauma, the theological, in very inverted brackets, justifications for like burning people alive, for like, you know, enslaving people, for raping young women, like there is none, there is none. I mean, you can try, but I just don't think that's where the conversation is. It's a useful way of distracting, distracting the conversation away from the geopolitics, which is a lot of a messier conversation onto a very essentializing one, which is ultimately, we have known since our first interaction with Islam that this is a violent, barbaric religion. Oh, that little trope easily crops you know, back into the picture. But, but ultimately, the, I don't know that, and I genuinely say this because I, if I did, I would say it, I genuinely don't think this is a theological conversation. I understand that there are theological arguments, but they are not theological arguments that have any weight with 99.98% of the Muslim Muslims in the world. So how are we sort of portraying it as if this is where the conversation's at? Right. Right, and uh, I think um, if people want to, and people, whether Muslim or otherwise, right, we're endlessly inventive, right, and creative, and we're going to find excuses for, for our, bad behavior, for, for, for actions, good and bad, right, we're always going to find justifications for it, so if, if someone is a certain way, is, you know, is, uh, and look, how easy for me to say, right, I, I have long hair, I'm kind of like a bit of a hippie living in, in the UK, I have a PhD, multiple degrees, like how easy for me to say, to, uh, uh, of course, do not, I do not believe in violence as a solution for anything, but, you know, if, if people are growing up and living and have, all they've known is violence, then I, I imagine, I check out some of the things you've been saying, it's, it's pretty hard for, for someone to think outside of a framework of violence. Because w what's the incentive, like to, to, to even be able to think clearly requires having basic yes. needs met like really literally to, to to be able to think as a human being almost right yeah and you know so. that, that's where Fanon would say that the violence of the colonized is a reflection of the violence of the colonizer and so Thank that you. applied just as much during the colonial era as I think it does subsequently you know people uh, of course uh Fanon, who um and for, for those who may not know deeply influential brilliant uh post-colonial thinker uh from martinique he did his studies in france experienced serious racism in france um was a, a, a medical doctor psychiatrist if i'm not mistaken he right, worked yeah. in algeria so you saw firsthand and this is during um the Algerian uh, War of Independence. During the Algerian War of Independence, I saw some awful things done to yeah. uh, NATO Algerian populations by the colonizing French forces. And um, yeah, I mean, his insights. And interestingly enough, I mean, I'm always, uh, I mean, it doesn't surprise me anymore, but it's it kind of, uh, it was a number of years ago where, where I was like, oh, wait a minute, Fanel was writing, he wasn't writing as an academic. Wait, this, which is, I mean, he was brilliant. Yeah. You know, he had the best schooling available at the time, but he wasn't writing as, a, as an academic for academics. He was writing as a person amongst the people for the people. And which is why, as far as I'm concerned, his, his writings still uh, have so much power. I mean, when I first read uh, Black Skins, White Masks, it completely blew me away many, many Same. years ago now. Um, but, yeah, uh, Fanny was, a, was ve very highly invested uh, morally and otherwise in the Algerian War of Independence. He was not an academic on the sidelines, kind of yeah. observing it and intellectualizing it for some paper he had to submit. 
Um, so or, or, or for some, or for some university job, which you know pays, you know, you know, his kind yeah, of thing. No, he was, he was yeah. in Algeria, yeah, yeah. in yeah. Algeria, and he was a witness to um, some of what we know to be the extreme forms of violence that were inflicted mm. on the Algerian population by French colonial, um, fr the French colonial powers at the time. You know, um, yeah. yeah. And, and speaking of public intellectuals and, and people who aren't just interested in sort of armchair theorizations, and, and you're someone, uh, you have a PhD from Oxford, I have a PhD from Columbia. Um, I made the very conscious decision of not wanting to do the same old, same old, become a professor just so I can publish and then perish at the same time, right? I, I, I mean, that was never what originally drove me, you know, I, I want to, in my own unique way, sort of contribute and, and, and give back to the community. You're doing some very, very interesting work. Don't, don't you think that, oh, again, I'm <laughs> putting words in your mouth. I think that the Academy um, is very, I'm very grateful for the training. I'm, uh, you know, it's, it's helped me tremendously as far as uh, sharpening my, critical thinking skills, whatever. But then at the same time, the academy I, I see as very much a moribund, moribund institution. It's, uh, I don't know if you agree with me on that. Uh, I mean, I think everyone has their role to play in the wider picture of social change that we want to see. And, I, you know, we need academics we need people who have the time to you know I if, if I could say one thing on that point I wish I could get paid to just not just I wish I could get paid to sit and think for a lot longer and write about my reflections I you know I, that would be amazing <laughs> I, I don't have time to do that in my life I am a single parent working household I don't barely get time to shower most days. So, you know, that's a luxury that is an important one because we need people who can think clearly with, you know, coherence and articulate that in a way that can provide, you know, the basis for like maybe people like you and I who don't want to pursue the necessarily institutionalized form of dissemination of knowledge to take a bastardized version of the argument and disseminate it on YouTube or on Instagram or wherever it may be, and maybe help spread awareness and consciousness of those ideas. But in the first place, we really kind of needed people to do the work. And I'm super grateful. I really loved my time in academia. I like I say, I'd be very happy if I was paid to do a lot more studying than I currently get to do. Um, but I could never remain in academia because for me, I felt a sense, I feel a sense of urgency with regards yeah. to the issues that I um, engaged with. And that sense of urgency means that at a certain point, I felt that I had to step out of that structure and take the discussion to the streets. Well, I, I think that's where, I, I, I will push back a little bit, I and mean, we don't have to go on and on about this, but uh, how you depicted the academy, that was largely what I thought of the academy before I spent years in there. I, I think it's, uh, with due respect, it's a little romanticized what you presented because I think there's some, there, there are a, a handful of amazing academics doing very serious, very important uh, intellectual work, you know, um, but all too often their um, academics, you know, they're, they're very egotistical. Again, I was at Columbia for many years. I was very lucky to have had some remarkable mentors there. Uh, um, but also the place is full of huge egos, huge. Like some of the big, I mean, you'd think, you think these people, I don't know, invented uh, something really earth shattering or something. <laughs> like, dude, no one knows you beyond these four walls. You do realize that. Like, but that's the nature, that's the nature of the institution. And um, 
I mean, I mentioned Fano's uh, example. Of course, Fano's is studied endlessly, right, within the hallowed halls of, of, of the academy. To, what, to, to how influential would he have been if he actually, you know, had a chair in, at some sort of uh, fancy university? Regardless, I mean, we don't, we don't have to go on and on about this. I mean, and uh, I want to be respectful of your time. But so if we could touch very briefly, uh, because I know you have to go soon, um, on, on the question of feminism, right? Because uh, that was that formed part, uh, that, that's like the third part of the, uh, the uh, series discussion. Um, so what, um, ha how do you self-identify? I've, I've heard you mention uh, elsewhere in other, you know, sort of discussions that you self-identify as Muslim feminist, maybe, uh, maybe I'm misremembering or not, not really. Uh, okay, how do you self-identify? What, what, what is feminism? What is the problem with Western feminism today? What are some of the problems? How has the Islamic tradition empowered you, perhaps, to uh, to be who you are today? Um, and uh, how has the Western context itself empowered you, right? Because let's not forget, perhaps a lot of the things that you're doing today would not be so easily done in many Muslim countries today. Sadly, that's the sad reality of it. I, I don't, I personally, based on my studies of the Islamic tradition, I don't believe at all that the, the Islamic tradition doesn't allow women, you know, or men to, to do everything that they want to and, and with themselves to make them, to, to uh, you see what I'm saying. But uh, the political circumstances are such that it's quite far from ideal. Uh, and so what, what are some convergences, perhaps, some divergences, if you see any possible futures? Um, so I would, so obviously I'm Muslim and I'm also a feminist. I don't know if I'm a Muslim feminist. I don't really, um, I, I don't necessarily know if the two words have to go together, but they, they're certainly both parts of my identity. Um, feminism, you know, is the radical notion that women are people. Um, as uh, I'm paraphrasing uh, someone uh, right there, but in essence, for me, feminism is one part of the wider struggle that I feel invested in by virtue of my faith, which is that I believe in the equality of all people before God. I believe in a state of balance on earth, which is currently very unbalanced. I think that um, if you look at the, the world as a, as a totality, you know, there's very few cultures where uh, when men have not been um, restrained through uh, legal measures uh, that they have actively uh, brutalized, <laughs> oppressed, repressed, um, women, women and often children. And so it seems to me that the, the lowest, there is a, a sort of lower, a lower basic self in, um, in humans, um, but, but, but in men, because there is the use of violence in the enactment of it, that has been to the detriment of other beings. So men have, in, have used uh, violence, and I, I went here. I use men specifically as opposed to humans. Um, men have used violence to uh, essentially, in many ways, establish a, a world to their singular advantage. Uh, and I think this is a pattern repeated, like I say, across the globe. And I think it's ethics, however you define them, which have sought to uh, restrain men's basic um, nature by calling on all humans, um, but perhaps with an additional responsibility vis-a-vis -vis those who have uh, the means of violence on their side, um, to uh, create a world in which everything is in balance and all beings are respected in their full humanity. And, and like I say, for me, that's women, children, it's the animals we live alongside, it's the nature that is our backdrop. Um, 
so feminism is part of a wider struggle for a balanced world, uh, you know, mizan <laughs> in our faith, the concept of mizan. Um, and so it seems to me an absolutely essential struggle for anyone who claims to be uh, a person of ethics, a person of faith, actually, that it's very clear to me that women continue to experience the hard end of many wedges, um, be it here or be it in other parts of the world, and much worse in other parts of the world, in fact. Uh, and it seems to me um, so uh, deliberately self-serving for men, and in particular Muslim men, to try and deny the importance of a feminist struggle within Islam, when all that really is, is a reaffirmation of the the essential principles within the faith itself and a recognition that those principles have been deeply subverted and need to be redressed. That is essentially what the feminist struggle is, but it, but it can't stand alongside, it, it doesn't exist on its own. You know, I would, I would refer everyone to uh, the Kumbahi River Collective statement, um, which for me is a referential text on feminism, but, you know, black feminists uh, have for a very long time pointed out that you know, feminism cannot exist in a vacuum, you know, what are, you know, what are, who are black women trying to be equal to when black men aren't equal to white men, you know, that's the key here. So obviously what we're saying, or at least what I am saying, and I know a lot of other people that I consider to be feminist pioneers argue, is that Feminism is one part of a broader struggle, but it has to exist along class struggle against anti-racism. Uh, yes, and you know, Bell, uh, Bell Hooks also obviously spoke a lot about these issues and uh, the idea that a feminist movement that doesn't take into account what often gets called intersectional um, feminism today, although I know there's a pushback against that term, but the idea that you know, feminism exists alongside other struggles for equality. And if you can't see, and it's so blindingly obvious to me that women continue to suffer uh, from the abuse of male power, um, then I almost don't really know where to begin the conversation. You know, I'm actually really only interested in speaking with people who realize there is a problem, but maybe don't necessarily know how to move forward with it if you can't see the problem my friend you just need to open your eyes and once you've done that then cool let's talk but there is not much conversation to be had with anyone that doesn't see the imbalance you know in this in 2022 even in the UK I mean before getting to Muslim majority countries which I would refer to as Muslim majority rather than Muslim because I don't know to what extent it could be said that the values that guide the uh, framework or the governing framework of that country could be said to reflect Islamic principles you know to me maybe I you know call me an idealist and I will take it um, for me you're an idealist okay. I am no, I, really, <laughs> I am and I really actually believe in the, the power of idealism uh, well, I, I mean I, I'm you know pot calling kettle black and the biggest idealist going it's like ridiculous but yeah keep it <laughs> we, we need idealism it's what's gonna keep hope alive and, and keep a, a belief that there is a different well a different world is possible but you know even here in the UK you know it's 2022 and you know uh I mean I'm a single parent household like fathers in this country are not required to even by law take full responsibility for their children they have to make derisory payments they very rarely can be enforced to actually take social moral responsibility for their children all of that falls back on women there is very little structure in place to support women when men abscond from responsibility there's also very little in the way of child care support for uh, you know, raising children, which continues to be something that is assumed to be something that women have to take the hit on, particularly in terms of their own careers. Um, 
careers on everything child rearing is a big part of you know a choice that you make when you become a parent but it's a choice you both make when you become a parent so on that point when you said both i mean i was actually um the point i was going to raise that do you think part of the problem without at all ever you know suggesting that there isn't a huge disparity as far as how uh you know uh men all too often treat women is a, it's a, it's a huge problem and um i think i don't like using the, the phrase toxic masculinity because it's sometimes it's overused but it's it's a huge problem uh yeah. because uh anyway what, what i was going to say is do you think part of the problem is in fact the societal you know how communities are structured we no longer have communities Right. Right. What, what's what's the, what, what's the saying? It takes a village to raise a child. 100%. Where, where are the villages anymore? Everything. I don't see any villages. Do you? Yeah. I mean, we have villages in theory, but no one knows anyone. The people don't yeah. know the next door neighbors. So, so maybe, uh, without again by any means at all suggesting that there isn't this huge problem, but but if even even with two present parents raising a child or two children, whatever the case may be. It's very difficult. Raising so, children yeah. is a full-time job yeah. and then some. Yeah. Like you have to raise children in your sleep. Yeah. Almost. I'm joking, but almost. Well, I mean, the thing is, it's a seven days a week, 18 hour shift job. It starts before your day job and it ends mm. long after the children have gone to bed. Mm. Um, but, 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 but I guess for me, that's almost like a separate question to the feminist struggle for me. That sure. begins right. No, it is a separate question. But, but yeah. I, th- I think we have like, the problems are so multifaceted and th- these are very complex problems. So yes, we absolutely 100%. I mean, I think one of my missions uh, genuinely is, is to, like one of the reasons why I think there's so much toxicity amongst men today is men don't know what it, we don't know how all too often, we don't know what it means to be a man. Like, so when we grow a beard and whatever, long hair if you're me, but you know, that's optional. Um, it's like, what, what are your responsibilities? How do you engage with the opposite sex, right? For example, uh, what, what can society expect of you? Like traditionally, historically, men had initiation rituals. Like that was part and parcel of becoming a man. You went through something very rigorous, very difficult, intentionally so, to mark a very clear, de- to ma- clearly demarcate between your life previously as a boy and then now this new life as a man. Mm. And um, it's, uh, it's not a joke. It's not, but now we have all these freaking man babies running around. Like, it's like, I, I hate them. You know, it's, there's so many freaking man babies running around. And, Part of the reason why that is the case is men don't have mentors anymore. Who, who are the real balanced men? I don't, I'm not talking about, we don't need saints per se, right? Like, let's forget about saints. Let's talk about men who are men, you know, they embody a, a sense of masculinity that other men can look to and say, he's cool. I, wanted, I want to be a bit like him, you know? And, and women don't see them and, you know, don't, don't see them and think, oh, my God, how what a scary human being. Like, you know, it's masculinity is not a bad thing. Right. Of In and of not. itself. It's a very yeah. important aspect of, it's, of part of the human, it's part of the balance. And we all have masculine and feminine dimensions. This is one of my obsessions, actually. But uh, it's women have a masculine <laughs> dimension as well as a feminine dimension just as much. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, sometimes it's in as it's. I've heard it put, uh, 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 it's, it's like this, in heterosexual ma- men, typically the, the, the energy typically is in the masculine dimension, and, but we also have the feminine as- aspect. And we have to learn to, inter- we have to develop both. Like, it's not a given that we're going to develop them just by virtue of being a, a guy. Same yeah. with women. Women have to develop their feminine side just as much as they have to learn how to work with their masculine, right? What? And it's a dance. What's so crazy to me is that so many men resist the idea of uh, sort of engaging or developing or working on their feminine side. And 
the maddest thing is there's literally nothing sexier than a guy who actually is in touch with his feminine side. Like you could do all the sit-ups you want, my man. Like, <laughs> you actually have some level. Of That's the real sex. reason I, I developed my like, feminine side. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the truth. That's like, the no, only reason. No, look, it's no like, so I'm, an, I'm artistic yeah. by temperament. So I was always kind of predisposed to, to, towards developing my feminine side. So the masculine aspect of my being, um, like I had to very consciously develop in recent years. Um, and and there's a long complex history. I mean, uh, the son of a very kind of archetypally alpha, tough, to put it mildly, father. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, real, I mean, I realized relatively recently that, oh my God, I. I said to myself unconsciously, I want to be anything, like I want to be the opposite. So my father is this entrepreneur, I want to be an academic, he's like very rational, I'm going to be the artist, blah, blah. But like in order to be balanced though, we have to develop both. And so yeah. the masculine, it, it's been, it didn't come easily. Like it's, and it's a, like, well, it's, a life it's a daily struggle. It's a life journey and yeah. it's, it's, it's a struggle. It's a daily, like, just like if I want to be fit, I have to work out, yeah. you know, I have to eat well. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I have to do my sit-ups, even if it's not as sexy as developing my feminine side. I'm joking, but um, I mean, um, let's face it. Everyone wants both, but you know, I mean, a guy who can do like a hundred setups, but is incapable of sitting down and having a mature conversation around issues in a relationship is not, you know, isn't. Well, we have way that. far too many man babies, and uh, this is uh, a huge problem. Men are not; they're not. Co- we don't have. I'm kind of repeating myself here. We don't have mentors, but also decent male friends who are going to call, you know, their friends out on their shit. Like, dude, you are really, what you're doing is shit. You need to man up. So when you were talking about toxic masculinity, which I agree gets thrown around a lot, for me, that's a really important and actually quite easy to challenge aspect of toxic masculinity. So you know, there are so many scenarios that I hear about where, you know, it could be someone sharing details of an intimate moment with a group of male friends and everyone having a bit of a laugh about it. Clearly that was not consented to, although, you know, that person consented to have an intimate moment with that one person. She didn't consent for that information to then be shared with a group of friends. It only takes one in the group to say, do you I think know. she would be happy the, with the, you the, the so-called sort of lo- locker room locker room talk? I I, I don't know why. Maybe it's because of my strong, like feminine side. Like I've I've always found that very kind of abhorrent. You know, and, and not just not just because of the Islamic sort of the ethics around that. Just I always found that really weird. Like what exactly to your point? Like this was an intimate moment between two people, individuals, consenting adults, et cetera, et cetera. Like yeah. why? So yeah, I mean, we need to really raise the game, raise the, raise the bar. Men but, do. but it could be, so for, I think in Muslim communities, like for me, it's things like, you know, when was the last time that you spent time, you know, that you gave your wife some, her time, like that you were said, babe, I'm taking the kids. You clearly need some downtime. If you want to, you know, whatever you want to do, this is your time. I can see how hard you work. What, is, what about... How often are you the one who initiates responsibility for the domestic tasks that are a burden on every woman's mind? And what I mean by that is she shouldn't have to say to you, can you cook dinner tonight? And you shouldn't pat yourself on the back for saying yes. You should already be like, babe, Tuesday, Thursday and Sunday, it's me. You don't even have to think about it. In fact, you don't even have to do the shop because I will be on that. You know, it's seeing the kids' dirty clothes and knowing they have sports day the next day, actually doing the laundry and packing the bag. It's, you know, knowing that it's her mom's birthday coming up and not leaving all of the organization of the celebration to her. It's recognizing also her emotional and you know we don't talk about these at all but sexual needs you know men in many communities continue to think of sex as something that men do to women they very rarely recognize that actually women are sexual sensual beings who have needs they are not just objects for you to dispense yourself in well, and that, I mean, yeah you know it's an interesting fact of of islamic history muslims don't know this and muslims one of the reasons I would argue why Muslims are in the <laughs> deplorable state that we're in today is because we we literally don't know our history. We don't 
We certainly don't know our intellectual tradition, etc., etc. Major, major, major Muslim thinkers throughout history wrote what today would be considered pillow books. Like, I mean, sex That's manuals. Right. That's right. Yeah. Because why the prophet, the blessed prophet said, you know, don't don't go to to your wife as a he camel goes to a she camel takes its pleasure and leaves. Like that's the that's the nugget, that's the prophetic kind of seed, based on which there's this flowering of of. And there's one book um, I wrote this um, encyclopedia uh, uh, entry on sexuality a few years ago, and so it happened to be the case that I did some some research in this as well, yeah. in writing that. And there's one I forget the the book's name now, sadly, because it was a few years ago now. There's uh, a, there is an encyclopedia of er erotology, so it was called erotology. So we talk about yeah. the, the difference between how we think about sex today in the Western world and how Muslim thinkers, Islamic thinkers historically thought about sex was that sex was never just like a penetrative act between no, people. I mean, there this, was a whole culture of right. sexuality, of trying of to charm the other person. There was a lot of foreplay involved. There Absolutely. was a lot of and, investment. And I mean, seduction is, yes. I mean, we've lost the art of seduction, right? I think we've lost it, you know, in the West as much as the rest of the world, maybe more so in the rest of the world. I don't know. I, I mean, I haven't lived in the rest of the world for a long time now, but um, this one particular manual um, yeah. it, it, uh, in which I think there's like 30 plus different names just for the penis. And mm. the so it's like, and we can't even talk about these things in, in everyday discourse now. Muslims okay. are like, oh my God. Okay. No, look. Yeah. Okay, speaking of the other and the orientalization of yeah. the Muslim, right, yeah. historically. So it's very, very interesting how this plays out in history. And it's been noted, but I don't think enough hay has been made of this point because I think it's a very profound point. So early um, Christian um, observers, Western Christian observers in, yeah. you know, visiting the Muslim lands, right? Yeah. They were struck by the lasciviousness of, yeah. of Muslim culture. I mean, Muslims, Ottoman society, Ottoman society literally had brothels. Like yeah. it literally institutionalized. Right it, yeah. It uh, literally so so look, okay, that's not Islamically co correct, but the point right. is th there were very, you know, sensual, you know, the hammams and things like that. Right. So then what happened? So historically, when Western Christianity, Western Christendom had a particular understanding of the body and you know and, and procreation and sexuality, et cetera, et cetera, which is very different from how it is today. It viewed the Muslim, uh, Muslim world as being lascivious, licentious, lewd, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden that the West is like so sexually progressive and permissive and so on and so forth. So now Muslims are so sexually repressive, right? Yeah. So it's interesting how that plays out as well. Well, so two things. So obviously the early Muslims who were engaging with Islamic culture were, you know, prudish Victorians, you know, and Victorians were, you know, this is an era of like, you have sex under the sheets with the light out, you know, <laughs> like this is lie back and think of England version of sex. Um, definitely no notions of pleasure, which were very much part of the discourse within Islamic societies because of all this literature around sensuality, erotology, um, and so, yeah, of course, the, the licentiousness of Muslims was, you know, this is where A Thousand and One Nights was brought back and it was actually censored, you know, there were stories that were considered too racy for Western audiences and they were actually taken out. I mean, the version we get today is like, the child's version of the original. The original, I think, would actually, and this is the funny bit, shock a lot of Muslims today. Um, and on the other point, per uh, permissiveness is not the same thing in sex as progressiveness, in my <laughs> humble opinion. Um, I think what we can take from uh, our manuals on erotology but also what other religious traditions I'm thinking particularly Hindu traditions uh, beyond the Kama Sutra which obviously gets a lot of att attention but was never designed as a sex manual it was a spiritual book within other books you know it was never it was never a book about positions which is what obviously like the bastardized version we get in the west today what you get within these um within these books on erotology are entire traditions around intimacy and around sensuality. And I think that's where, you know, if we wanna talk about where, in my opinion, a lot of men are lacking, 
in this particular domain is that they are getting their sexual references from pornography. So for example, I would say I would never want to be with someone who watches pornography. Now, I know that when I make this comment, a lot of people laugh and they go, are you crazy? All guys watch pornography. That is actually probably true, <laughs> which is why I am where I am. But what I will say is that that's also part of toxic masculinity, the enabling of the normalization of watching pornography versus educating yourself around erotology and sensual traditions and lovemaking and what that actually can be to enhance female pleasure. And you mentioned like a lot of men feeling like they don't know what their role is in this world. Your role is to be in service to others, starting with your family and also starting with your wife. How are you in service to her on a daily basis? How are you helping support her? Is that something that actually even factors in your brain? Because mm. I'll be honest, I don't think it does for a lot of guys. Like, if you they're do... man babies, man babies only care about themselves. That's and, and, right. And, and, and I'm glad you touched upon uh, the question of porn because it's uh, it's a huge problem and. Um, it's uh, sadly very, very common, it's, it's consumption. And um, it's very interesting also, historically, I, I remember hearing about this way back when, that for the longest time, pornographers, um, they, they, they tried, uh, but with very minimal results in creating women-friendly porn. Like women, just, you know, and, and it turns out, you know, women are wired slightly differently than men. You know, women are, are more cerebral. Um, shock horror, <laughs> women are more cerebral, <laughs> men are more visual, right? Yeah. So, so but, but interestingly now, more and more, and, uh, uh, from what I can uh, tell, uh, that women are increasingly consuming porn now as well. And, yeah. But it's a huge problem. I, I think it's a it. huge problem. Yeah. Well, it's a market for it, but also um, I think people are just, um, there's something, I don't know, I mean, you can call me a conspiracy theorist or, or whatever, but I, I think there's normalization happening across the board, you know, the, the, the lines are being blurred between porn and movies and there's some, uh, but you know, it's, it's very weird. I mean, the, we, we no longer, the erotic is no longer uh, celebrated so much, right, as, so, as you say, and yeah. very kind of simplified and anim. I don't know, even know how to kind of brutish sex has has taken taken over, right? I think uh, there, there is an attempt um, around the movement of you know so called feminist porn. Not all of which I would necessarily advocate, um, mm. but you know I, I I think that the idea within driving at least some of the feminist porn movement has been the idea of resurrecting an eroticism mm. that is rooted in something beyond you know what men are doing to women mm. uh, and you know there's obviously like whole plots you know <laughs> and yeah. uh, there's a lot more I, to them I, I wonder if the medium yeah. in and of itself is can be salvaged though I, I seriously doubt that, it's, it's, that, it's very big, problematic yeah. because it's it's one thing I think to read uh, 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 literature and like that's a very different experience from witnessing uh, uh, an act. It just uh, I don't know. I think there's something personally. I mean, in sort of ideal terms, this is how I tend to think. I think um, uh, you know the human body is 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 sacred, and you know there there's certain conditions under which you know. I, I mean, look, I mean, there's so, so many problems now with people's personal, you know, photos and what have you being plastered across the internet. Yeah. I mean, there's huge issues with privacy now. I and mean, this stuff is really dark. Uh, anyway, but uh, I mean, I don't know how we got on to talking about porn, but uh, well, I mean, the, 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 the relationship, I mean, the traditional, or if we don't want to use that word, the, um, the, the balance between the masculine and the feminine dimension, uh, dimensions, which is which is a divine balance, which is divinely mandated and promised for us, right? If we do the work, right, then we can see it manifest in our you know individual and personal lives and our family lives and yeah. you know onwards and outwards in society. 
but it takes work and it takes men because as far as I'm concerned, I'm not saying this, you know, because this has been my shtick for some time now. Uh, I'm not just saying this now. Um, like as far as I can tell by and large, you know, with exceptions, of course, because no, no, it's perfect. I mean, you know, by and large, women are doing the work by and large, relatively speaking, men all too often aren't with rare exceptions. I think there's some incredible men out there as well. But uh, I, I think the huge imbalance that we have, um, if it's not uh, uh, addressed sooner rather than later, we're only going to go from one deepening, you know, ever deepening nightmare to another ever deepening nightmare. It's, um, yeah. Well, I, I think women are, by and large, if we can make the generalization, <clears throat> we tend to be more relational, as in we yeah. tend to have more uh, conversations with our, you know, I mean, I joke about this all the time with my with my friends who are guys. I'm like, oh, you know, if I meet up with my girlfriends, we will have like an, a couple of hours debrief on everyone's where you are. What are you? Mm. What's going on in your relationship? How are you feeling? Mm. What's your state of mind? What's troubling it's you? Amazing advice, yeah. you know, input. Yeah. You know, we challenging, unpicking, and then I'll speak to one of my guy friends. And I'll be like, "What? So, what did you guys talk about?" And be like, "The football." Yeah. <laughs> for three hours, like oh, that's that's, ridiculous. you guys didn't talk about like where you're at, what what you, what's mm, going on, like so how cool. you feel. And I'm sure this is changing. You know, there are. I'm sure, like a. Yeah, I think yeah. particularly with like Gen Z, you know, that the guys in the Gen Z generation are mm. a lot more open to those conversations. Yeah. Um, well, no, so my God. fear, though, that's probably true. My fear, though, I mean, I hope uh, and it's an ongoing discussion and project, right? I mean, it's a lifelong thing, but I hope they're not losing sight of the important, you know, masculine dimension as well, right? Because too, too much of one thing, you know, too much of a good thing, no matter what that thing may, may be, is a bad thing, right? So, so people in, because in, we, we also have a plague of nice men, right? Like and I, men who are kind of like really sort of sappy and, and um, polite. I'm not saying men should be nasty. I, I, so often people react like you're saying like nice men are a bad thing. Yeah, men who, they have to be compassionate. They have to be kind. That doesn't be nice. Sometimes standing your ground, standing one's ground in society in general means taking on tough positions, like a position that one has to sometimes die for. That's not, a nice guy can't do that, you know? It's interesting because I think, I actually think this is not, nice is not the right word. I think mm. that the guys who get called the nice guys are men who are not necessarily driven by a hot cause higher than themselves. And that could right. be some sort of like life goal, some ambition, some like deep sense of achievement. And so they're sort of just like floating along life. And actually they're, they're decent guys, but they're just not right. that interesting because actually they're not sort of driven by something a bit more visceral. And so instead, because we live in patriarchy, instead of saying, well, your problem is that you're not actually pushing yourself to mm. figure out what your higher purpose is and why you're not actually giving it everything you have. We say, oh, it's because he's too nice. No, 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 no. We can yeah. keep the nice bits. Everything about him being nice and compassionate and understanding, <laughs> we want to keep what we want yeah. in addition. Well, you see, is a magical I'll, 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 of purpose. You know, I'll push back a little bit uh, against that only because I'm not nice, clearly. But no, I, only because um, uh, look, uh, this is my this is my understanding. It's all too often the so-called nice guys, in keeping with everything you've said. I mean, th th it's all of that, and relatedly, they just haven't really worked on themselves. They haven't really developed their inner core, like not not in a muscular sense, like in their inner. You know, they, I, I mean, I've heard it put like this that men. You know, they, they, the, the, the nice guy or the wide-eyed kind of guy, he just sits there and you can, it's like the world is just impacting upon his eyes. You can almost see this almost, there's almost like a wide-eyed character uh, aspect to his, the way he presents himself. Whereas the man, a man, and look, it's an ongoing project. It's, it's, not, it's not a case of getting 
doing something, that's the end of the story. It's ongoing every day. Men, however, when they look out onto the world, you can see that they're projecting onto the world something. There's something coming from within. That's because they've taken the time to develop themselves. They've taken yeah. years out of their lives to study, to reflect, to, to, to grow, to contribute, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and also from the nice guy, I've experienced this, you know, few, too many times at this point, it's really not fun. As a guy, I've experienced this. For, the nice guy all too often will stab you in the back. Like he's all very sweet talking on the surface, when push comes to shove, because he, he hasn't really developed himself as a man, he, he really doesn't have true substance yeah, yet. He's right. getting there. He will, you know, when the proverbial shit hits the fan, he'll turn around and be like, oh, my God, did you hear what he, oh, my God, blah, 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 blah. Instead of owning his, mm -hmm. his stuff, admitting where he, when he, where he went wrong, et cetera. But uh, anyway, yeah, is... so I just think that's much more to do, to do with, you know, men going on a journey of self discovery, self understanding and connection to a sense of higher purpose. Yeah. And that in a patriarchal world that gets dismissed because that would actually require men doing some work that yeah. gets dismissed in favor of you just need to be a bit more of an asshole in your relationship with women and you'll be fine. Oh, no, no, that's not what you I'm know. saying at all, though. No, I, 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 yeah, I'm yeah, sure yeah. that's not what you're yeah, saying, but, I, but not of yeah. the kind of right. don't be the nice guy discourse. Oh, it's kind of like treat her mean yeah. to keep her keen, this oh, kind God. of no, no, I, no, I don't believe that at all. I believe, I believe, like I, I have less patience for men doing crap stuff to me than the women. And, you know, I'm just kind of, I have more patience for, like I can put up with a lot more, you know, because women are human beings and crappiness comes up every so often, right? That's just the nature of things. I'm, I'm more willing to put up with, you know, certain of, of those things for women than I am for men. Like, because I, 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 I try to hold myself to high standards and I expect, you know, the men around me to, to hold themselves to high, higher standards as well. So anyway. I hope so. <laughs> well, I mean, there, there's no, there, there aren't any, uh, there aren't, and, and the alternative is miserable. Um, and it's not worth it. It's, it's really not worth it. But thank you so much uh, for your time. It's no uh, been a very fun discussion, very interesting. Got to talk about lots of different things. Okay. Um, best of luck uh, in, in everything that you do in your film projects. And um, yeah, by, you know, hopefully we can do this again sometime. It's a great pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. You, you must and thank, thank you to everyone time. who was watching. But, yeah, and please like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking <laughs> nicely. <laughs> All right. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank